Good afternoon. I am Dr. Anushree Bailur. I'm a senior staff psychologist at the Counseling Center. And I think this is actually my second year doing this talk with uh, Europe. And um, it's about being brave in research and actually targets a lot more, um, you know, experience of imposter phenomenon more than anything. And hopefully today we can just talk a little bit more about, you know, just what does it mean to be brave in research and leading with curiosity? Uh, because at the end of the day, that's what research is about, right? You want to just have your curiosity lead you. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And uh, but before we get started, uh, I want to start mindfully a little bit. Um, and I know that when we talk about mindfulness practice, we typically think about meditation, right? And that's like the buzzword as mindfulness everywhere. But um, I want to just actually challenge that notion a little bit because meditation is not the only way we can practice mindfulness. Um, so I'm hoping, if you all are willing, um, to join in because it's absolutely your choice if you want to join in on this practice or not. Um, it's just about observe, um, you know, mindfully observing your environment with all five of your senses, all right? And given that it is an afternoon and I'm assuming it is the beginning of week eight, everyone's feeling pretty anxious about midterms and papers and everything else to come, uh, I thought we could just take a minute just uh, to orient ourselves to being here in this moment in time and go from there. Um, and again, it's up to you if you want to participate or not, but it's just about using all five of your senses to be more present minded. So we'll just start with sight. Um, and you can absolutely choose to look around the room or if you want, choose to just uh, look at the screen or the image on the screen and observe what sticks out to you. What sort of colors jump out to you? Um, and uh, what do you just sort of, what objects stick out to you? What, you? what do you find interesting? What do you find visually just sort of sticking out and holding your interest? Take a, take a few seconds to just look at the picture and if that's what you're choosing to you know, focus on, or if you're looking around the room, what just sort of sticks out to you? What holds your interest visually, All right? So you're looking at it, you're using your sight, And next, let's actually get oriented to being here in this room. So I want you to pay attention to what is the temperature like right now in this room? Is it hot? Is it cold? Is it comfortable, uncomfortable? What about the chairs you all are sitting on? Is it soft, hard? What is it like to sit on that chair? Is it comfortable? Are you moving around? Do you find you're feeling kind of restless? What is it like to just sit in this room? Right? Next, just I want you to pay attention to your, you know, what you're smelling. You might not be smelling anything, or you might be smelling something. Maybe you had just a mint or something and you're smelling that, or you just had coffee um, near you. Whatever it is, focus on what are you smelling right now? And if you don't smell anything, just focus on the cool air entering your nose and the warm air you're exhaling. Breathing in cool air, exhaling warm air. All right. Next, anything are you, what are you hearing? Focus on what are you hearing? Maybe it's the hum of the computers or the laptops or just the hum of the AC that you're hearing or the heater. What are you hearing? And finally, let's focus on touch, right? Like, what is it like when you're just t touching any of the surfaces? Is it cool? Is it hard? Soft. And just orient yourself to being here right now. OK. So this is just sort of like grounding exercise. So whenever we're feeling kind of overwhelmed, sometimes it can be good to just orient yourself to the here and now. 
because when we're feeling kind of overwhelmed and thinking about, oh my God, I have the next thing to do, next you know, task to just c accomplish in my to-do list, and you're getting caught up in your thoughts and spiraling, it can be helpful to just sort of slow down a little bit and check yourself to say, I'm here right now, let me focus on what I can do right now in this moment, where am I at, right? So this is just another way of being a little bit more mindful and you're grounding yourself to the present moment. All right. Um, so then I'm hoping we can talk about what does it mean to be brave in research and please participate in the, in the discussion as much as possible. I know it's week eight, it's Tuesday afternoon, you all are probably exhausted already, but um, I want, I'm actually genuinely interested in your, hearing your thoughts about what does it actually mean to be brave in research? What comes up to you? What comes up for you when, when you hear that, that phrase? I think to a certain degree, it's like you're willing to like engage yourself when you're in a research lab. You're willing to like kind of engage with the subject. You're not just kind of like passively doing what you know. It's on the instructions. You're like you know asking questions, trying to like go more in depth about things. You feel confident in like interacting with the material. Mm, mm -hmm. So actually engaging with the material. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I would say like um, letting your curiosity like be known, like presenting your curiosity, like yeah. especially like in a lab, like say you have like an idea, so like you'd be like presenting that idea to other people and getting their thoughts on it. Yeah, getting your getting your ideas out there to just see. Okay, I'm curious about this. What are all your thoughts on this? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, love it. Anyone else? Yeah. I think it's also about being open with things you don't know about. Yeah. Like, not experienced, you can just say like, oh, I'm not sure what this is. Can you help me with that? Yeah, absolutely. Owning up to, hey, the, I, I don't know what I don't know, so can you help me? Love it. So just sort of that intellectual humility, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I saw a raised hand there. Oh, yeah. If you're um, asking to be part of a group or not, like how to um, like overcome the fear of rejection or whatnot. Yes, absolutely, right? Just even just taking a chance to say, I'm going to ask to be part of this. Even if there is a chance I'm, I'm going to be said, like, yeah, I can be part of it. I'm going to ask anyway, right? Just overcoming that fear is a huge thing. Absolutely. Yeah, great answers. I'm so glad that you're also saying this because um, we're, it's actually quite tied into the experience of imposter phenom phenomenon. And I'll just kind of go into it a little bit. So before we kind of get there, I want you to just take a look at the questions. And um, just, you know, if you want, you can just answer it out loud or answer it to yourself. Um, do you believe that your accomplishments are, are because of luck, timing, or error? Do you find yourself telling yourself that I, if I can do it, anyone can? Do you agonize over the smallest flaws in your work? Are you crushed by even constructive criticism, seeing it as evidence of your ineptness? And when you do succeed, do you secretly feel like you've fooled them? And do you worry that it's just a matter of time before you're found out? Kind of like, just put those questions up there for a few more seconds, ponder on it. All right. Well, the good news is if you answered yes, you're in good company right, to any of those questions. So someone like even Albert Einstein has just sort of talked about how, you know, the quote from him is, the exaggerated esteem in which my life work is held makes me very ill at ease. I feel compelled to think of myself as an involuntary swindler, right? And it's that, that uh, aspect of, oh, I kind of fooled them, I got them, right? People will find out that I'm actually a fraud. That's part of the imposter phenomenon. And someone like, Einstein, whom we think that, you know, is pretty, you know, smart. He came up with, a, you know, some, some small theories here and there, right, that we still use till this day. Even he experienced this, right? And um, even someone like Maya Angelou, who is incredibly accomplished. Um, I've written 11 books, but each time I think, uh-oh, they're going to find out now. I run a game on everyone, and they're going to find me out. Right. Um, so there's an aspect to the imposter phenomenon that makes it feel like you're not supposed to be there or you don't belong. Right. And that's actually something that can be signs of an imposter phenomenon. But before I even just go there, I want to ask you all, when you think about, I mean, you might have even heard of it as imposter syndrome, right, or imposter phenomenon, what comes up to your mind? Yeah. Um, the idea that you're not meant to be 
place that you're at. Yeah, yeah, so I don't belong here. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Anyone else? Mm. Something else led to them instead of you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's sort of saying my accomplishments are actually it's because of pure luck that I got it. Not because of your persistence and hard work, but rather I just got lucky or someone grading me was just went super easy on me, right? That can happen as well. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else? How do you think it might impact people? If you're going into spaces feeling that I'm not supposed to be here or that any of the accomplishments that I'm having are actually because of pure luck, how do you think that might show up in your work? Yeah? Uh, there's less confidence in general and you might not work as well. It mm -hmm. might actually be, be a positive feedback loop for yeah. it feeds on itself and you uh, feeling that you're not accomplished enough will make you not work as hard. Yeah, yeah. So you, you're less likely to take a chance on doing things. Absolutely. Yeah. You also had your hand up? Basically the same. Yeah, great. Y'all are like right on the track. Okay, so yeah, parts of like, you know, the signs of imposter phenomenon is just feeling that you don't deserve recognition or any of the successes right? Um, that's part of it. And even just having difficulty internalizing accomplishments and often attributing any of the successes that you're having to external factors. I got lucky, or my professor was grading me super easy, or the TA I had for this section, oh my god, yeah, my TA is super, super easy and understanding, that's why. Um, rather than your own ability or, or intelligence. And Kind of like believing that, hey, people are overestimating my ability to get things done, right? That's kind of the fear of like, I'll be found out that I'm not actually supposed to be here or that I'm, not, I'm actually not that smart enough, right? Um, so people are overestimating how, what I'm capable of. That's the belief, right? Or, and and um, kind of like what you mentioned, engaging in that feedback loop, right? Where you're discounting your own sort of accomplishments and behaviors um, and kind of really having that fear of failure lead the way of just saying, oh, oh, I might fail at any time, right? And that's actually what's like leading the way rather than curiosity could be that sense of, oh my God, I'm, I can fail at any given moment, right? Um, and you're just also, there's a part of um, imposter phenomenon where there's a part of you that just says, just because I accomplished once doesn't mean I'll accomplish it again, right? Just because I was able to do this one task doesn't mean I'll be able to repeat it. So um, kind of like part of that is not having confidence in your own abilities and um, really living in that fear of, I'm gonna be found out that I'm not supposed to be here. Someone will find me out, right? And the biggest part about it is despite all of the hard work and all of the accomplishments, there's no sense of like actually enjoying the work and the success and the accomplishment at the end of the day. It's rather just a sense of, oh my God, whew, I finished that paper. I did not think I would finish it, but I finished it. Um, rather than just saying, yeah, I finished it, woohoo, I'm done. And I did work so hard on it. It's more about, oh wow, I just like, I got that one through. Right, just saying like somehow I got that paper back, I did well, but I don't know how, rather than actually enjoying that success. Right. Um, so, and and all of these like impost, you know, signs of imposter phenomenon can be experienced when particularly um, people are, um, you know, feeling like an outsider already. Right. So when you're going into particularly for like women in STEM fields experience this because there are not as many women represented in STEM fields, I think. Hopefully it's just like the, it's changing a little bit, but it needs to be changed even more, right? But in any way, it's like in any sort of population, if you just have an underrepresentation and you're going into a space where you don't see yourself a lot, you're gonna feel like, oh, I'm not supposed to be here, I'm an outsider, right? So think about in terms of, you know, other ethnicities, um, immigration status, um, gender, um, you know, any of the other sort of identities that we carry within us that makes us feel like an other can actually, you know, um, uh, contribute to us feeling like an imposter or a fraud, right? That's kind of where it primarily just sort of shows up. Um, but what do you all think about this? 
What are some thoughts coming up as you're looking at, hey, these are some signs of imposter phenomenon? Relatable, not relatable. Hmm. I'm going to take it as a sign of, OK, you're just going to think about it. Let it sit for a little bit. But um, in general, though, right, when we are experiencing imposter phenomenon, there's a quote from um, just sort of saying, hey, imposters see themselves as unworthy of the level of praise they are receiving because they do not believe that they have earned such recognition based on their capabilities, causing heightened levels of anxiety and stress, right? And good old BuzzFeed, you know, just like saves the day. But basically, anytime you get any sort of recognition, there's a part of you that just goes, oh, it's because people are super nice to me. Or they actually don't really know me, so they're just only seeing the surface level, right? That's the only kind of two beliefs. Rather than saying, oh, you know what? It's because I am, I am pretty accomplished. I have worked pretty hard. And I deserve to be recognized for the hard work, right? So why does this happen? Why does, why do we experience imposter phenomenon, right? Part of it is, you know, we kind of know already, like I mentioned before, society, kind of like feeling like an outsider, right? When we're coming into spaces where we don't see ourselves, and this is why that phrase representation matters, is resonates with a lot of us, is because when we see ourselves in a, in a space or any, in anyone like, you know, just sort of saying, okay, you know, I actually can do this. I don't. It's, it's not feeling like I'm not supposed to be here. When you see yourself reflected in someone else, it kind of feels a little bit more welcoming, right? And that's kind of why representation matters. And in society in general, and we can have another whole talk about it in general, but there's so many systemic things in place that sort of acts as barriers to us feeling like we belong and having us be represented at different levels, right? So that's one part of it. But also just think about it in a certain different way, in a different way as well, in terms of today's you know, Insta culture, right? Where you throw a filter on it and everything looks great and perfect. Um, and, you know, as we scroll through TikTok or Instagram or any other, you know, as much as be real is be real, it's not really real. So um, all of those different social media accounts that we have kind of portray a sense of this is how life is supposed to be. It's supposed to look perfect, right? It's supposed to look effortless. When in reality, what we're seeing on a lot of social media is more about the outcome rather than the process. Because the process of getting anywhere is a little bit messy. It's not, progress is not linear, right? It kind of goes up and down, and no one quite sees the process of getting there. They only see the end result, which looks great. I mean, I can throw a filter on things and it'll look great. However, we have to just figure out, okay, how did that person get there? What was their journey? Right? And that journey is going to be full of ups and downs. And um, that's also part of the society, right? where we kind of get caught up in that sense of we have to be a certain way to actually get recognized, when in reality, it's OK for you to struggle. It's OK to fail. And um, it's OK to learn from those experiences. And that is also part of the process of learning. Right? The other part is also just in general, where we are in the setting that we are in in school, right? You all got into UCI. You're plenty smart. It's a difficult school to get into. And um, one of the things, though, is to get into UCI, you had to be kind of competitive, right? You were probably and you know one of the you know top students in your classes. You're used to being that way. And there's a competitiveness that goes into being in schools, right? So um, when you're being that competitive, there's no room for error, right? You, there's a sense of shame almost that comes with saying, I'm struggling with something. I'm struggling with academically, for, for example, right? Or just saying, I don't know if I can even ask that question because people will, might find out that I don't know actually what I'm doing, right? So that might hinder people from actually asking questions um, and having curiosity lead the way. Right. So um, it's actually having to unlearn a little bit to so saying it's actually OK for me to acknowledge that I don't know this and ask questions. Right. Um, so that that's part of it is schooling and just the environment that we kind of grow up in. And partly, you know, is family, too. Think back onto your families and reflect on how were your during when you got your grades back during report, report cards. 
how were your A's and B's acknowledged? Or A's and A minuses, sorry. Uh, so um, how were they acknowledged? Were you only focused on, did your family sit down and just say, OK, we see that B. So tell me what happened. Was it the conversation on what kind of went wrong, right? Um, when it's not really, it's just more about saying, OK, I, this is something that can be improved on. Was a conversation only on that? And what, did it completely disregard that A you got in a different class, right? So that is also kind of contributing to that sense of, oh, we only focus on things that need to be improved on. We do not focus on what is working well. We do not acknowledge what is already going well for you, right? And that can be an internalized message. So when you get a good grade on an exam or a test, it's sort of saying, yeah, OK, fine, whatever. But that one comment on that paper that said, oh, I, you should have expanded more on this, that is a comment that you will focus on and just say, oh my god, I did not do well. right? So with imposter phenomenon, you're more likely to um, you know, fixate more on the constructive criticism that just says, you know, that says, just because you got one comment of constructive criticism, you're saying, that's a failure. right? That can happen with, construct, uh, with uh, imposter phenomenon. So again, it's about having to unlearn and just say, huh, I do have accomplishments. Just because I got constructive criticism or feedback saying I can change certain things, it doesn't automatically mean that I didn't do well. Right? It's about bringing more flexibility into our thinking. Right? What do you all think so far? Yeah? OK. Nodding heads. I'll take it. OK. Um, and I know some of you already talked about this already, but how does it show up, right? Um, I think, you know, one of the things that was mentioned was already holding back, right? So sort of uh, in that fear of being found out or fear of failure, you might just find yourself saying, oh, I'm not going to ask that question. I, maybe it's, it's better for me not to even ask that question and find out, you know, never mind. People will find out that I'm not sure what I'm talking about or that I'm not supposed to be part of this group if I ask this question, right? Um, or on the other hand, it could look like over preparation where you're spending hours and hours and hours where you're saying, okay, I have to be 100 and 10% prepared for this so that I know every single thing. I can anticipate every single thing that can go wrong, right? And that's a lot of stress to carry. <laughs> um, uh, or it could just look, look like procrastination. I often just say procrastination is the same, you know, the, it's another side of the same coin of perfectionism. Because if you think about it, if you're saying the standard has to be, it has to be perfect and I can't fail, I'm not supposed to make any mistakes, that can be pretty intimidating. It can be intimidating to even get started, right? But when you think about procrastination as, I'm only going to wait until I have a few hours left before the deadline, and that pressure to just say, it's due now or else, you can't submit it, you kind of let go of the perfectionism, and you're just telling yourself, I don't care if it's perfect or not. I just have to get it done and submit it, right? So that can also happen, where procrastination becomes more of a working style, right? And never finishing, right? That might also just be how it shows up in positive phenomenon, which is just sort of saying, you might get started, but how to keep going? You might just sort of lose that motivation, and you might not quite finish the things that you just start. And all of that kind of leads to self-sabotage, right? Where um, you're having thoughts of just saying, I don't know if I'm supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to, like people will find out that I'm not supposed to be here. Maybe people are thinking I'm way smarter than I actually am. And that can main, like that can just sort of contribute to you maintaining a lower profile, saying I'm not really gonna speak up, I'm not gonna take a risk, I'm actually not gonna pursue opportunities, right? And that is a form of self-sabotage if you think about it, right? And the impact of it is, yeah, you're not going to try out new roles um, or you know, new things in general, because there's a part of you that's just sort of saying, this might not work out. right? And that fear of failure is actually just what's going to keep you from trying it out. And um, even just, um, you know, just sort of saying, like, there's a chronic sense of self-doubt or um, low self-esteem and burnout, especially if you're coping with imposter uh, phenomenon experienced by doing so many different things that you're getting burnt out, right? Just saying, I have to be over prepared. I have to anticipate every single thing that I can. 
that you are getting burnt out. That's also how it can happen. And it can trigger a lot of feelings of sadness and anxiety. Think about it. If you are constantly telling yourself that I'm not supposed to be here or I'm not smart enough to be here or that I'm not good enough, that can experience, you know, that can um, end with a lot of like anxiety that can trigger a lot of feelings of anxiety and sadness um, and a lot of isolation, right? Because if you're living in that sense of I'm not supposed to be here and people might find out, you might not, you, you're kind of living in that sort of like a dreaded secret kind of mode where you are holding on to the secret that I'm not supposed to be here and people will find out. So you're not connecting with others. There's a lot of isolation going on saying, I hope that others don't find out that I'm not supposed to be here, right? So there's a lot of that that can happen. And um, just increased level of just overall stress in general because of all of that, it's a lot to carry. Right. Um, so that that sense of chronic self-doubt really has a huge impact. If you think about it. Can you explain like what like between like that self-fulfilling prophecy and like a prophecy? Yeah. Um, so self self-fulfilling prophecy can be part as um, in, in terms of how it can actually just imposter syndrome or phenomenon can show up as part of like um, self-fulfilling prophecy where you're telling yourself like I'm not supposed to be here, I'm not smart enough, I'm not going to take that chance or I'm just going to not try it out, right? And it's a self-sabotage thing that's happening where you're not going to try it out so um, or you're not going to ask that question and um, then you're not going to get like you're not having that opportunity now and because you don't have an opportunity now you're telling yourself see I knew I wasn't good enough for that, right? So it's, uh, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't go after it, you're not going to get it. Right. So it's a self-sabotage and it's also a confirmation bias. You're kind of looking for evidence just to confirm already that that one belief that, oh, yeah, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not good enough. Right. Um, and that can happen. And we'll actually just talk about how do we challenge that the self-fulfilling prophecy or the confirmation bias to have a little bit more empowering thoughts, because that's also part of how we can um, manage imposter phenomenon and challenge it actually a little bit. But great question. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Any other thoughts about this? All right. Yeah? Uh, this seems similar to imposter syndrome, but I'm not sure that it is. It's not so much of uh, fear that uh, one's accomplishments aren't well earned, but that one will not be able to accomplish what they want. Uh, well, it's a little bit of both. Because imposter syndrome is, I'm calling it imposter phenomenon rather than a syndrome, because syndrome kind of makes it seem clinical when in reality, imposter phenomenon is experienced by a lot of people, right? Um, it, it's, it's sort of, it's not to a clinical level, but you might see literature just referring it to it as imposter syndrome as well. But it's a little bit of both, where um, it's not, it's, it's sort of like one saying, I'm, you're doubting your ability to get it done, but also feeling like other people might be doubting your ability. Did I get that right? Am I getting? Okay. The syndrome versus phenomenon, you mean? Oh. Uh huh. Yeah, it's both. Yeah. It's both. It is. It is just sort of saying I'm. I don't know if I'm capable of it. Um. Or you know, and, and it's the other one as well. It's, it's sort of a combination of both, and it kind of depends on um. Like, for for example, for some people they over prepare, right? And other people might just sort of like completely, you know, just avoid it altogether, right? So just sort of holding back. Right? So it just depends on which way you're coping um, and in what situation it's coming up in. Yeah. Great question. But yeah, so what do we do when this shows up? Right? So it's first off is actually becoming aware that you're having imposter thoughts. Um, so just sort of like catching those thoughts and we'll just talk about it, like challenging these thoughts. Let's catch it, check it, change it, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. And more than anything, it's about adopting a growth mindset. It's that like a lot of the imposter thoughts kind of can stem from a sense of you, failure is not an option, right? Perfection is what we're aiming for. Um, or just even just saying there's a lot of shame associated with not knowing, right? So a growth mindset can be what will be helpful to just get past the imposter phenomenon where you're telling yourself that I am capable of learning. That's what the growth mindset is about, is not, you are not doubting your ability to learn. It's kind of giving yourself permission to just say, yeah, I don't know, I am struggling, 
and yet I know I'm capable of learning, so let me see how much I can learn. Rather than only focusing on the outcome, you're focusing more on the process of learning and growing. And um, kind of adopting that growth mindset is just kind of believing that you're capable of learning as much as possible and you're letting curiosity lead the way, right? And um, really identifying your strengths um, as much as possible. And I even just sort of say, I'll, I'll just go over it later, but you want to make even a list of your strengths and accomplishments. Um, start having a CV, right? Just sort of put down any of the accomplishments that you're having. That, and it doesn't have to be accomplishments that other people will recognize. Just what makes you feel accomplished, right? That is also important to kind of acknowledge. Some days, my accomplishment is that, hey, I made it to work on time and I'm really proud of that, right? So sometimes you just take the small wins and other days, I, um, you, you know, I get really excited about something that was pretty big, a project that I've been working on and it's done, right? So um, it's, it's important to acknowledge the small wins for the day along with your big wins. So it takes a lot of effort, right? Think about a big task that you have and all the sub goals that come up with the task. Right? So it's important to recognize the strengths and the effort you're putting in as you're working towards your bigger goals. And really practicing self-compassion, right? So if you um, were to, you know, if when talking to a friend and if your friend is expressing thoughts of like, yeah, I don't know if I'm supposed to, I don't know if I'm going to go for that, that research group, I'm, I'm not even going to talk to the professor, I, I don't think I'll get in, there's no point, it, I already feel like I'm not supposed to be in this class. People are so smart in this class. I don't even know what the heck they're talking about sometimes. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to go to the office hour and even ask about this. Would you tell your friend, yeah, you're not smart enough. Why are you just like, why are you even asking this? You shouldn't be just like, go. You shouldn't be even thinking about going to this research group. Would that be a response? Or would you have an alternate response that's more compassionate, right? You probably... Hopefully you're leading with empathy and just saying, hey, you know, you're, this class is a difficult class. It's okay if you don't understand some things, but what do you got to lose if, you know, by asking your professor if you want to join that research group, right? So um, practicing self-compassion, treating yourself as you would treat a friend is really going to be helpful here. And the other part is actually seeking out a lot of mentorship and support. Because you'd be surprised as to how many of your professors and TAs are experiencing imposter phenomenon till this day. Me too, here. I have a doctorate and till this day, I doubt myself. I have imposter thoughts that come up saying, oh my God, I don't even know if I'm supposed to be here. Like, what am I doing here, right? So we have moments of that and it's okay to just sort of seek out support and talk about it because the more you talk about the imposter thoughts, the less secretive it becomes. And you'll just find that a lot of people around you are having similar thoughts. And it's not so much of a taboo anymore. It doesn't have to be only your secret to hold. It's more saying, you know what? We have moments of doubt, but it doesn't, have, it doesn't mean that I'm not supposed to be here just because I happen to doubt one, you know, sometimes that I'm supposed to be here. Did what I say make sense? I'm sorry. I'm having a little bit of uh, difficulty wording today. So uh, let me know if I'm not clear enough. But yeah, just make sure that you're talking to people, you're relating to them. It doesn't, and just um, bring down that stigma that you're not supposed to feel a certain way, right? And also remember that an apple is an apple and it's not an orange and that's okay. And I know these are not apples, but I like the video. Um, but basically what this means is that if you're finding yourself stuck in a comparison game, which can happen, saying, you know, I'm actually not as smart as the person next to me. Like that person is so smart and they have so much going for them. Why would I just be part of this research group when that person is, right? Um, sort of saying, I, I don't deserve to be here. I'm not as smart as that person. Well, let's slow down and acknowledge that that person has a lot of oranges. Their strengths are oranges. Right? But, and you have apples. Don't discount your apples. Your apple is an apple and not an orange, and that's okay. So let's start with identifying what your apples are. Acknowledge that you even have apples in the first place. And think about, okay, what are my strengths here? What are my apples? And even make a list, right? That's going to be an important aspect to um, challenging imposter phenomenon. 
So the other part is, you know, having em empowering thoughts rather than self-critical or doubtful thoughts, having more empowering thoughts. So catch them. Becoming aware of thoughts is catching them, checking them, changing it, right? So catch it, check it, change it. So sometimes it can look like, you know, when imposter thoughts can look like catastrophization, right? You're going and jumping to the worst possible scenario. The, you know, worst thing that can happen is going to happen. And that's 100% true. When um, realistically, you want to just like take a step back and just say, OK, what sort of evidence do I have supporting that the worst case scenario is likely going to happen? And what sort of evidence do I not have supporting this? Right? Think back to the scientific method. Right? You're going to question findings. Put on your critical thinking you know, hats on towards yourself. Uh, think about what sort of evidence do you have supporting these thoughts? And are these thoughts facts or are they opinions? Because there's a difference between the two. I can feel that the sky is green. It doesn't make it green, right? It's more of an opinion. So you want to make sure that, okay, what am I, what are my thoughts fully grounded in facts, right? And are there, mo are, are there more things to this? Is there more to this context than I'm considering here? Is there, am I only looking at one side of the argument here? Am I looking at the whole context at all, right? Um, and am I assuming that the worst case scenario is the most likely scenario? That's an important question to ask, right? Especially with for living in failure, like that fear of failure. Well, how do you know that you're going to fail? And what if you fail, right? What's the worst that can happen? And are you assuming that the worst that's going to happen is the most likely scenario? Or are there other ways of looking at it as well, right? And again, what would you say to a friend going through this? Are there more helpful, compassionate ways to respond to the situation you're going through? And also giving yourself permission to say, it's OK for me to struggle, right? Because it's OK when we're going through research and we're doing studies. Not all studies are going to come out with, you know, like disproving the null hypothesis, right? So we have to be ready to just say, okay, even that is a data point, right? Even when we don't do well, that is also a data point of just saying, okay, where do we go from here next? That's a learning experience as well, adopting that growth mentality. What do you all think about this? The whole empowering and catch it, check it, change it. Any questions about it? Give me an example. Can I think of one? <laughs> All right. So, um, well, let's just see. For example, um, let's say that you talk to a professor and about going joining a research group, and the answer is no. That can happen. Yeah. So our minds can jump to a place of, see, I knew that I don't belong here. I'm not smart enough, right? I'm not smart enough. That getting a no from an, my, the professor means that I'm not smart enough. That might be the thought you might be having, right? What sort of evidence do you have supporting this thought? Okay, I got a no. I got rejected. Okay. Well, what evidence do you have not supporting this, these thoughts? Is it just one research study that you want to be part of, you got a no from? Are there other pieces of evidence telling you that you're not smart enough? What sort of evidence do you have? For example, just do you not understand anything in the class? What about your, all the other classes you've taken at UCI? Right? All the classes, all the information that you've learned so far throughout your academic journey. Does it just show that does, it, that, does that data point just say that you're not smart enough? Would a friend if, come to you, coming to you just saying, you know what, I, I talked to Professor so-and-so and they told me that I can't be part of their research group. Now I just feel like I'm so dumb. I knew I wasn't supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be at UCI. I know that I'm, I'm, just, I'm just really beating myself up. Why did I even ask now? Would you just sort of say, yeah, you shouldn't have asked. What's wrong with you? You're not smart enough to be here. 
that wouldn't be your response, right? You would have a compassionate response. What would the response be to your friend? So catch check it, change it. Because just because you're, you might get rejected, you might get a no, does it mean that that is forever? Are there other opportunities available for you? Right, so you wanna just be on the lookout for, okay, what would my, I tell my friend if they were going through something like this? And what is the growth mentality here? I'm not saying, hey, don't get sad because rejection sucks, right, at any level. So getting a no from a professor you wanna work with, yeah, that sucks, absolutely. I'm not saying don't feel sad or don't even feel stressed out because that's not fair, you're human, you're gonna get impacted by that. I'm also saying just because you got a no doesn't mean it, it's a no forever in terms of you'll have no other opportunities or that you're not smart enough at all for other opportunities, right? That's the growth mentality aspect of it. Um, so that's, that's another way of just saying, okay, how can I change this, like the thought to be a little bit more compassionate towards myself and a little bit more empowering, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Does that answer? Yeah. Only disproves that you're not qualified for the research group and not necessarily anything else. You're not qualified for everything, right? That can be the generalization. Just because you got rejected from that one group doesn't mean you're going to get rejected for every group. Thank you. All right. And some of the other practical tips that we kind of talked about before already is talking to other people about the imposter syndrome and imposter phenomenon. Um, Again, be open. I challenge you to be open about experiencing these thoughts, um, especially with a TA or a professor or a trusted mentor that you have. Um, and you might just be surprised at the results, right? Um, and the other exercise is saying thank you when you get recognized rather than, oh no, like you, when someone just says, oh my God, that was a great paper that you wrote and that, or that presentation that you made was really great. It's not about, oh no, yeah, I just threw it together at the last minute. That can be the usual response for many of the students that I see. But in fact, no, just say thank you, own it. Even if it was a last minute thing that you did, the fact is you had that knowledge within you and you had the ability to put it all together. Great, own it, they say thank you. Um, and uh, reward yourself, right? When you accomplish something, reward yourself. Even if it means you're going to get boba, which is my favorite, regardless of the rain, I'm going to have some boba, right? Uh, reward yourself. Treat yourself. It's important to do that, the small accomplishments, right? Um, sometimes, I swear, y'all, I treat myself when I make it to work on time. Like, I'm telling you, that's my, my treat. So it's important to reward yourself with small accomplishments, all right? And again, write out that list of strengths and accomplishments. Small things go, small things and big things. And um, in fact, you can even maintain a strengths journal, right? Where at the end of the day, you can take a moment to reflect on, hey, what sort of strength did I rely on to get through today, right? If you know one of your strengths is in organization, right? Okay, you know what? I was able to just get organized and get through the day today. Go me, right? Or if it was, you know, I actually, you know, one of the things that I'm really proud of myself for today is I spoke up in class. I asked that question when I was really not sure about something, right? Go ahead, just recognize that that is something that, if, especially if you know you're hesitant to ask questions and speak up in class and you did it, it's important that you recognize that you put in the effort, right, to do things differently. And again, being your own friend, I can't emphasize enough about that. Um, I know I use exaggerated examples, but it is for a point because the way we talk to ourselves, we will never talk to our friends that way, right? So that's the whole point of being your own friend. And again, just um, you might know about Katherine Johnson, um, but one of the, the, in terms of curiosity leading the way, um, what, I love this quote from her, take, take all the courses in your curriculum, do the research, ask questions, find someone um, doing what you are interested in. Be curious, right? Ask those questions. If there is a part of you that's hesitant to speak up and ask for something, go back to that place of, hey, it's okay if I just fail. It's okay if I struggle and it's okay if I get a no. I'm just here to learn, right? Let curiosity lead you the way because now you're going to get an answer and based on that answer, you'll know your next steps, 
right? <clears throat> and again, like curiosity is a willing, a proud, and eager confession of ignorance, right? So if you, if you are ever worried about, oh my God, I don't know this, and what if people find out that I don't know this, I'm screwed. Right? That might be the typical thing, especially if you're in a discussion in a research group and you're discussing an article that you're supposed to read and you're like, I read this article, but it makes no sense to me. I don't understand a single word this article said. It's okay to go from a place of ignorance and just say, yeah, I had a really hard time understanding this article. Are there other resources people use to understand this better? Right? Because a confession of ignorance can be the start of building a knowledge base. Right? So don't be afraid to just sort of say, like you mentioned before, just embracing that intellectual humility, saying, I don't know this. Because that's kind of where research starts, right? Just saying, I don't know, but I'm curious to find out. And again, making space for all that's there. And this is an important aspect of um, even when you're feeling really, really anxious and having a lot of those thoughts coming up saying, I don't know if I'm supposed to be here. I don't know if I'm good enough. You're feeling really anxious about talking to a certain professor about, um, or even speaking up in class saying, I don't know, I don't want to sound dumb, right? It's important that you make space for all that's there. Um, rather than saying, I'm not supposed to feel a certain way, go ahead and just say, you know what? I'm, I know, I'm, I'm seeing, experiencing that I'm having these thoughts right now and label them as thoughts. I'm having a thought that I might sound dumb. Rather than saying I am dumb, make sure that you're acknowledging it's a thought that you're having and not all thoughts are true, right? So you wanna make sure that you're making space and you are getting some perspective on them rather than saying I'm not supposed to be feeling a certain way, right? And actually I'm gonna have you all just do a quick experiment here. It's a thought experiment. So if I tell you, Whatever you do right now, don't think of a white bear. What comes up? Yeah, a white bear, right? For me, it's always like the old school Coca-Cola polar bear ads. Do you all know about that one? Yeah, that's the one that comes up to my mind, right? Whenever I think about a white bear. Um, but now I'm just going to say, OK, you know what? If you find yourself thinking of a white bear, acknowledge it. What happens now? Do you even, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, right? It's like, all right, it's just one of those things that's just there. So that's the same thing here. If you're telling yourself, okay, don't think about it, don't think about it, don't think about how anxious it is to speak to a professor, just, just don't, right? The more you tell yourself, don't think about it, your two-year-old brain, right, because it's kind of like that little kid that says, I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you, right? It's your brain literally just goes, oh, I'm hearing you just sort of say, oh, you are anxious about speaking to the professor, right? And it goes on and on and on, and it becomes more of an intrusive thought, and your anxiety level goes up. Instead, make space for all that's there. Recognize that, yeah, you know what, I'm having a lot of anxious thoughts about speaking to my professor, and that's okay. It can be intimidating to do that. And finally, just as this is a, just a little bit of a tip, just given that we're in week eight um, and final season will be upon us soon. Um, Y'all, we're at Irvine. I know that rainy season, all of that set aside, it's still beautiful. We have a beautiful campus. Let nature nurture you, right? Um, there's a lot of studies out there just talks about how exposure to greens and just nature in general um, actually just helps you perk up your brain. A little bit more cognitively you perk up which when you're studying for finals or even just midterms I'm assuming is a huge thing to do right so um, it not only just like helps with um, perking up your brain it helps you regulate emotions um, so I encourage people to go on a walk go on a mindful walk remember that exercise we did in the very beginning right engaging with all five of your senses right what colors are you seeing as you go walk through campus walk through Aldrich Park. What are colors are you seeing? What color are the trunks of the trees? How green is the grass, right? As cliche as it sounds, stop and smell the roses as much as you can. And even if it's only 10 minutes, right? The 10 minutes is enough. 
a mindful walk can do wonders. And it can be especially helpful if you're stuck and you're struggling and you're like, I don't know, I have a writer's block. I don't know where to go from here. Go for a walk and come back to it. That can be helpful. It similarly can be helpful with like regulating your stress, your emotions, and you know, you can concentrate a little bit better. And the cool thing about it is while direct exposure to nature is what works best in research studies, that's what they found, they also found that even exposure to pictures of nature's blues and greens had a similar effect, not to the same extent, but to a similar extent. And ever since I found that out, I've been putting you know, pictures of nature randomly here and there in my presentations because we can all use a little bit of boost. Uh, but yeah, just let, let nature nurture you. And especially with all the rain now, I think we'll have a lot of green. So let that work for you, right? Um, so that's kind of like a like, nice little tip, I think, especially as you're heading into finals. And finally, just breathe. Remember to breathe because this is also part of you taking care of yourself. I know that sounds odd when I say this, but when we're feeling stressed out, we breathe in and we forget to breathe out, right? And uh, for all you bio majors, uh, you might remember your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, right? Your sympathetic, when you're stressed out, gets activated and your heart races, you might feel clammy, your muscles get tense because your body is getting ready for fight or flight. You can activate your parasympathetic nervous system, which just helps you to sort of relax and calm down through your out breath, right? That's why when you're feeling anxious, it is, it is really, really important for you to breathe out, right? So I like to do the breathing exercise of four, two, six, which is in breath, four counts, hold for two, out for six, right? And if you can, get it to four, four, eight, right? So for all you math people, right, four plus two is six, four plus four is eight, right? So your out breath is always going to be longer than your in breath. Um, and that's going to be helpful with activating your parasympathetic nervous system. So right before you go and take your exams, you know, either midterms or finals, it might be helpful for you to kind of take a deep breath and remember to breathe out, right? And um, that can help you just sort of relax a little bit so that your mind is not going all blank when you see an exam, right? Um, so another quick tip on that. And there are a couple of other you know, apps out there. Um, the meditation app is pretty good and there's a U, uh, UCLA mindful app that's also really good. You can just sort of use that as well. And Headspace, of course. Um, and just remember that I'm doing the best I can. I'm not perfect and that's all right. Right, again, just letting curiosity lead the way rather than that sense of I have to know everything, right? And just a quick kind of tip, like um, just info on our services at Counseling Center. We are open Monday through Friday, eight to five, but we also have after hours crisis support. So if you call in overnight, weekends, holidays, you just have to select option two after calling us and um, you'll be connected to um, a, a crisis therapist. Um, but we also have workshops where you don't have to um, sign up ahead of time. You can just show up. We have Wellness Wednesdays where we go over some helpful skills um, and you can just come in, get that information. Um, and we also have the Beyond the Ring Road series for graduating seniors. I think it's a little bit more helpful, but I just threw it in anyway in case you're interested or you have friends who might be interested in it. Um, and there's the academic boot camp series, which kind of goes over how to maintain your motivation, how to reduce avoidance behaviors, um, and just even um, how to just sort of keep going when the going gets tough, right? Um, that's academic boot camp series. But that's what I have so far for y'all about today. Um, and these are other ways to connect with the Counseling Center if you're interested. We do have our social media pages that puts uh, you know, updates with all the events that we're holding as well. And if you get a chance, I would love for you to all just scan the QR code and complete uh, a feedback form, just giving me some uh, info on just how you felt today's you know, presentation went for you. What are some things that were helpful, were not so helpful, so that I can you know, revamp it a little bit better. Um, so yeah, please feel free to give me some feedback about that as well. Um, but I'm going to just end this here. I do want to just check in with you all to see what came up for you during all of this, though. Any comments in general? All right. I'm going to just like let you all be, but 
thank you so much for participating and um, helping me just also just you know um, explain a few things a little bit better uh, i really appreciated that and uh, yeah feel free to contact the counseling center if you have any other questions or concerns thank you